Well, I've got a question, and, and maybe I don't know, Mika, you'd be one of the people I'd like love to ask it of. Um, okay. <clears throat> and it's just it's like a concept I've been trying to develop, and I don't know if it's a good idea, but it it made me think of it because of the Twitter lists and stuff. So you know, I've been I've been kind of focusing on this regeneration worldview question. You know, how do you make the world think about positive things and achieve abundance, and you know those kinds of notions. Um, and it, and there's a bunch of people who are creating content around that thought. A lot of the content's pretty good, but the content's not widely distributed. There's no there's no nobody has a big channel. I guess yeah. is the thought. And the and the and the notion was well, let's create a big channel. You know, could we create a, a network, an ESPN for regeneration? Um, and it, and I'm assuming it's a pretty obvious notion. And I'm just wondering, does it ever work? And I mean, well, you kind of you kind of did it with um, uh, back in the day. And I, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts of how oh, you, you I had a big whether, channel. Well, <laughs> you were you were working on building a. Well, maybe you yeah, know maybe we had a we had a moment. Yeah, I, uh, you owned the topic for a time. I'd say. Yeah. The that's a great idea, and I, I would say arguably you may be closer to success than you realize, and you just have to keep plugging away. Um, you know, the, the, one of the weird things about when does something catch on is, uh, you know, probably lots of people were each trying at different moments, but you know, one gets the wave. Um, so I wouldn't presume that, you know, if it hasn't caught on yet, that it won't ever. Um, uh, I did stumble on something called the Gaia Network the other day, uh, which is is a cable, you know, channel. Uh, and, you know, I found it because I was interested in watching uh, a little documentary about uh, astronauts who have experienced being up in space and who have who talk about how that changes their their worldview. Maybe it even came up on one of these calls. Um, uh, the problem is that the Gaia network is mostly about um, new age spiritualism. Yeah, I saw that eye roll, Jamey. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's sort of like, you know, if you're looking for the, the good stuff, uh, it comes with a lot of woo woo. Um, With regards but, to that particular topic of um, astronauts, have you met Rusty Schweikart? No. Um, Jerry, you might have, because he was a GBN network member. I don't remember ever actually crossing paths with him, but I know he was part of the, the GBN group. Yeah. He was uh, an Apollo astronaut. It was on um, the Apollo 10 mission. Uh, and I had a conversation with him at one point. He talks about have, he was out on a spacewalk. Um, and there was an issue that came up and NASA essentially told him, okay, you just, just hold tight for a minute. And he had an incredible opportunity to just be there looking at the earth in right. front of him right. without having any other responsibilities for that 30 second, 60 second period of just being able to absorb. He said it was you know, absolutely the most life-changing experience he's ever had. And I think he's still around. So yeah, he has someone who has had a, he, he is someone who had that extremely rare experience, but even an even rarer version of it, because it wasn't just the seeing it as part of something, they, do, doing other things, but yeah. One of the astronauts who's centered in the documentary I'm thinking of was on the first mission that, went to the moon, but he was the one sitting up there, you know, circling while the other astronauts were down. In and the so command he module. A lot of, he also had a lot of free time. <laughs> but Michael Collins would be that astronaut. Right. Yeah, something like, I mean, there are a number of them and there are some younger ones who have only been up in the space station um, who are also interviewed. And they all talk about the transformative effect of seeing the earth as one thing. So there's a natural conclusion from this, which is all we need to do for world peace is send everyone up to the space station or something similar. That is definitely not what Jeff Bezos has in mind, but... Um... <laughs> Irony clearly intended, but... Yeah, yeah. And, and the other thing they do point out is that while the, the cliche is that there are no boundaries visible from space, 
um, you know, that the, the borders are a social construct that in fact boundaries are visible from space. Um, but uh, Dave, I will look at your, uh, your concept doc and I do think um, that this, this, this notion of, uh, you know, a different type of media system is one of the ideas that's out there bubbling. Um, okay, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I don't know. It just seems like a natural fit in terms of like, it seems like it's a worker-owned co-op, you know, the media creators yeah. own this, own the support, you know, right. and there's a bunch I mean, of talented people doing good stuff, but just none of them are, you know, breaking through. Yeah, you, you invoked, you know, ESPN for, you know, you, know, you, you picked a media franchise um, where they talk about winners and losers a lot, which is not a great uh, notion for regen. On the other hand, Sports Center is one of their most popular um, formats that isn't actually covering a sporting event. It's talk. And so why don't you do, um, you know, Regen Center? You know, you need to have, you know, dialogues about why is this important? You know, most of the people that I've heard talk about the topic, like you, and most recently a uh, uh, Art Brock, talk that I invited him to talk to people-centered internet, where he mentioned that as, as part of the uh, living systems metaphors that he advocates, you know, in terms of currencies. Um, you need to really kind of get people to watch a conversation as opposed to a monologue, right? I think that they would really get engaged with a conversation, Dave. So that would be my thought. Yeah. And so, and the way I've been kind of framing it is there's a lot of people trying to do various formats, right? Like hosting right. conversations and stuff. And sure. so I don't really want to like be designing the formats. I want to try to somehow aggregate the, by, the assumption is if we could aggregate the people, then the, we could grow the audience. You know, well, that's the Huffington because, Post model. <laughs> maybe, you're not maybe. writing anything. You're just re yeah. well, maybe, actually. That's, broadcasting that be what's already there and becoming an anthology, you know, of here's what's going on this week, you know? So, I mean, you know, like by every having every, and they're all individuals for the most part, are very small organizations, right? right. So none of them have the capacity to do great search engine optimization or, you know, they're not doing media campaign, advertising campaigns of any kind or, you know, right? Things, the things like that, that you that probably work well if you can you know, aggregate enough uh, eyeballs. Uh, so I really like the idea of not having this be a broadcast aggregated eyeballs thing, but rather be a series of nested, con slightly, con lightly, loosely connected conversations. Mm -hmm. I, I love that idea. And I think that the more those conversations don't face inward, but face outward and include people who disagree, the more powerful the network actually becomes. So that there could be a trope, a method, you know, you know how there's like table for six, which is a really efficient dating mechanism because tables for six are really chatty and work well. Um, you could do something similar. There's a bunch of sort of democracy in action kinds of things that get people together and just lather, rinse, repeat and do it as informal Zooms, do it as a face-to-face, -face, you know, dining in, in areas, whatever it might, whatever it might be. But, but build a network that isn't just a damned broadcast system trying to get eyeballs. Because sure. because the I like there's good news networks, there's a bunch of stuff out there. I I've grown really resentful of broadcast media. And sure. and I think the answer to fix things is actually engagement of different of lots of different levels. And and we've talked a bunch about this uh, with Stacey Abrams and deep canvassing with a bunch of sort of things, but but there's an opportunity here to use regeneration as a meme theme uh, unifying vortex to actually connect people and talk through the issues. And then I'll, I'll layer onto that. The thing I'm trying to figure out right now is how to build a persistent memory from what we learned from all those things so that we're not always just repeating everything and wasting time duplicating our efforts all over the place. So then how do these conversations contribute to a Wikipedia-like but different entity that starts to put together how this shit works? Right? That's really, really helpful, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm dividing, designing an old old style model, with an, an extractive model when I need to, uh, need a yeah, regenerative I, approach. Exactly, you need a regenerative model. And there's this opportunity to build, the technology is cheap, uh, there's an opportunity to build something very regenerative. And yeah. and also, like, I, I was, uh, I, I did some angry tweets before getting on this call, 
And one of them was about, uh, you know, uh, rules and regulations around assault weapons. And I'm like, look, people, I can put plastic on a bolt action rifle and make it look really sexy and it won't be any more dangerous than a bolt action rifle. The AR-15, as Jim Fallows has written about uh, umpteen times and others, the AR-15 was designed to be insanely lethal to humans. The, the, the bullet comes in, tumbles, goes out like a grapefruit and destroys everything in its path because it's extremely high velocity, very low, low mass. So it just like rips through people. You can't save the people. With an, with an other bullet, even with a big slug that's going slower, it makes a big, it makes a, it makes a hole. If it breaks things, you kind of fix them. You can, you can patch somebody with a different weapon. These we so, so for me, any weapon that is designed and has this kind of effect should be, a, should be military grade only. And anybody found with one should be put in jail. They should be confiscated, buyback program, whatever. But that doesn't exist any place on a place where we can sort of point to it and say, this is why, here's the evidence, this is how that's different. And any, any, whenever you see an interview of somebody with an NRA or a rifle person, they're like, well, you don't really understand. She, cause, cause assault rifles, everything could just like, you just pull the trigger a bunch of times. It's like, yes, they're right actually, technically, because nobody's looking behind the curtain at what the issues are, but we could, we could figure those out together and then stop being ignorant and, and, and duplicative all the time because it's a waste of time. And while we're busy wasting our time, the other side is busy making inroads. Yeah. Part of the problem on that particular issue is that a lot of the legislation around restrictions of, you know, quote unquote, assault weapons is, has been mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, has been, um, cosmetic. Magazine size. Yeah, absolutely. Magazine size. Is there, is, is there a front handle? You know, right. is there a pistol grip uh, on the on the stock? It's, yeah. it's well, and things that that you basically the the mini fourteen I think is a is a rifle that fires the exact same uh, ammunition as the AR fifteen, but it looks like a like a sort of bog standard hunting rifle. Exact same weapon, exact same effect, but it looks different. And it was not on the assault rifle. Assault oh. weapon list. Assault oh. rifle and assault weapon are different things, and it's it, it's so easy to get caught up into the um, the jargon arguments. Yep. Like, do you, did you say clip? Well, clip's wrong. You have right. to. It's an it's a magazine, not a, it's all the stuff that is used to distract from the. Well, I was going to say the meat of the conversation, but that's a little on the nose. Um, yeah, I I think that the. Um, most salient thing that I've heard recently in this regard is we have a tendency to move all of the energy of the conversation toward the single NRA, right? Um, th those are the people, you know, that we're, I think that to remove the NRA out of the conversation and go directly in name the gun manufacturers, name the people who are manufacturing the bullets, okay? Name the um, Yeah, that, you know, this is a front organization for, you know, an amalgam of interests, right? Is just <laughs> don't give them any more airtime, go directly to, I think the problem is Remington Firearms. I think the problem is, right, name the companies that are making the stuff because they want you to pay attention to the NRA as the front organization so they aren't seen they yeah. need to be seen the they nra was designed there. was developed as a um as the target exactly you're, you're spot on and I, i'm just saying um you know we need to pull the curtain up and say, look at all the actors, the economic actors that are you know behind this right and um let them stand yeah. forward with you know the outcomes of what they make there, to that to that point the the gunman who shot up the grocery store in buffalo and the gunman who shot up the school in texas both use ar-15s that were made and sold by a particular manufacturer who's been who has been so aggressive ab about marketing um, they actually have something that they sell with the name of the, the urban super sniper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to see one manufacturer, it only take one to step forward and say, um, like buying 
one of the very advanced um, automobiles um, that you actually have to come to and, and learn how to drive this thing because you, you, you're not going to know, right, you know, the minute, you know, we, we give it to you. So um, our, you know, um, company, we won't sell you one until you come and take training from us. That would be actually responsible, right? Step forward, right? Because then you'd be moving more toward the way the Swiss treat, you know, very um, heavily armed population, right? But completely different outcomes, right? Because of the way that they think about it, the way that they train, you know, that's like an entire, um, it's, it's, it's basically the way the Second Amendment was run, a well-regulated militia, right? Is so it, that's what the Swiss population is, where we have a uh, you know, bunch of people who can. What was the quote of the week the other day? Easier to get a firearm than it is to get baby formula right now. <laughs> Man, crazy. Yeah, you're crazy. more likely to go on a federal list if you try and buy uh, Sudafed. Yeah, uh, yeah, hundred percent. Right. But the, the thing is, is that the the political power of the gun lobby is now bound up in, you know, I, it, it's hard to tell anymore what's the engine and what's the caboose. But mm -hmm. uh, the the far right, the mainstreaming of a whole far right worldview <laughs> um, where owning a gun for and especially a lot of guns for a lot of people is an identity statement. Sure. Um, and the every effort, I was thinking about this the other day that if you had to, you know, crystallize the identity of liberal versus conservative, you know, a liberal wants stronger government, a conservative wants more guns. Um, and, you know, the more we liberals say, hey, sensible government would regulate these things. What the conservative hears is they're coming to get my guns. I got to get more guns. Um, and and Mika, you're, a, you're in a Mika, very, very bad loop. Mika, your last newsletter was really great on this. Although I found my conversation with you clearer than your newsletter this time, because you made the point really well that, um, that the grassroots movements for gun control, gun action of some kind have been co-opted by kind of the Bloomberg envelope in some way. Um, and I didn't get it as, as firmly from, from what you wrote, unfortunately. Um, but, um, you know, it's, uh, gun control has become gun safety. It's like scrub gun control from your, from your vocabulary. No such thing. It's only gun safety now. Well, that, what you have is the, the world of data-driven campaigning uh, and message testing um, has determined that the word control uh, doesn't do as well if you're trying to move, you know, your swing voters um, towards, uh, you know, something they believe is possible, right? So safety is a better frame. Well, I don't disagree with, you know, pick the frame that works best for you. Um, but the, to me, there's a different uh, problem in that the Bloomberg Borg has uh, come into this space with so much money and with such a controlling apparatus that uh, even when we had uh, the kids from Parkland create something new that no one expected and that was very effective in reaching young people, um, it too was seen as competition to be absorbed rather than, uh, you know, a healthy alternative way of approaching the issue. Um, and, you know, so it's interesting that many of the kids from Parkland are no longer involved in the organization they started. Um, and the one who is, David Hogg, has made very clear that he has political ambitions. He wants to run for Congress as soon as he turns 25. Um, I, I'm just struck that after Uvalde happened, and the first response of many people was, that's it, I'm done. I'm ready to, you know, take action that would show that we will no longer accept this, that, you know, business as usual has to be interrupted, that no, quote, responsible gun safety organization 
was going to do anything with that, right? Um, they want a very controlled approach to lobbying to, you know, get some incremental legislation passed, and and that the 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 politics of this now is very tightly controlled. It's crazy, yeah, but, it, but, but it's going to get changed. It, I, I think that there is likely an external force that will change the conversation because there are other lobbying that will come in to counter this. And that is, we're likely to see other governments start to say, it is not safe to travel to the United States. <laughs> it's already okay? Once we get a listing that says, look, you know, there, there are 30 events a weekend, all right, where people are getting killed in major cities, all right, it is not safe to travel to the United States, that other state departments, all right, are putting up flags saying, don't go there, right? It's not a good place to go to. There's a really, you know, there's a lot of money that comes in from tourism, right? That once we get tagged, we hit that tipping point. Um, there is a, you know, a whole different counterforce that will come in that say we cannot be characterized that way. Just that's stay tuned. Okay. The thing is, Kevin, that, that actually several several countries, European countries, already do have specific warnings about the U.S. I got that. You know, but I, I'm just I think Germany not... was like saying, "Do not travel to Florida." But the the question is, is the will the governments make a statement about that? Is do the citizens of those countries follow that statement? Again, and once there's actual an actual reduction in tourism, then you'll get that. Then you'll see that kind of response. But just simply a statement from the German government, just or whatever, it, it, it's, it's a it threshold. Mean much of it's just a statement. I know, I, and Jimmy, I I agree with that, but it's it, it's not a tipping point yet. All right, right. It, but it can be. And I'll tell you the the people who are, you know, that run the airlines and run the hotels and run, you know, if they all decide to call, right, their, you know, elected officials and say, you guys got to do something, all right, they will, all right, because the amount of money that flows in that direction versus the gun industry, all right, is substantially larger. Hey, you know, you you guys talked at the beginning about uh, what was it? You made did an eye roll. I just wanted to add another eye roll thing. Um, Jerry, you're familiar with uh, some of you may be familiar with this whole notion of spiral dynamics. Yep. Um, that Don Beck, who was one of the proponents of this and worked with Claire Graves on, you know, you know, inherited his experiments um, from upstate New York died um, in February, March. I mean, there's a service for him in Denton, Texas that I'm gonna see um, online this Friday. And the thing is that spiral dynamics started off as a psychology experiment by Graves and has become kind of a cult, right? I mean, you know, so it's eye rolly, you know, in its own way. The taxonomy is very well developed, right, in terms of descriptive language. However, nobody's ever bothered to replicate Graves' experiments, all right? And, you know, I could, you know, I said, Don, you know, the only way that this is going to get legit is you need to have some other researchers replicate the experiments. You need to see whether it actually works outside of, you know, <clears throat> upstate New York, all right? And, he, you know, he and, you know, people who were traveled, you know, those circles resisted. And I just talked to somebody the other day. I said, now that Don has passed, right, this thing either has the ability to potentially do the replicability, right, to, so that it can rise to the level of going from hypothesis to thesis, or, you know, it's going to be, and it's going to remain in its cult-like state. So I just, Put a marker in the ground that um, it has a moment that it could, you know, become something more legit, and it has the seeds of being a really interesting hypothesis. But that's where it stands at the moment. There's um, 
there's kind of a lot of clarifying work like that that needs to be done in the world. It takes me a little bit back to what I was saying earlier about where's our scaffolding for sharing ideas and improving mm -hmm. ideas over time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's the replicability crisis in psychology and sociology where many, many, many studies that led to policies are, are not replicable. They're just proving that like, oops, something was off or conditions yeah. have changed or people aren't really like that. Um, <clears throat> so, so for me, this collective inquiry, this, this, this joint quest together to answer those kinds of questions should be like the happy work of, of, of some large slice of us, like 10% of humans ought to be engaged together in that quest. It doesn't need to be everybody by any means, but, but some goodly hunk of us ought to see that as our civic duty, as our collective human endeavor, as part of what learning and teaching means, all of that kind of thing. What was the I quest, Gary? That. Sorry. The quest, to, so uh, Kevin was just saying that spiral dynamics and Claire Graves experiments ought to be replicated. And how do we how do we sort of do that? And I'm just sort of spinning off from that saying spiral dynamics is one really fascinating set of models about how the world works and what to do about it. Um, I was just reading a long form piece about Steve Bannon yesterday by Jennifer Senior, which was an insanely good article. And he was a big believer in the great turning theory, which basically says every 70 years or 80 years, there's like a psych, there's yet another cyclical theory of, of human history. It's like, awesome. How do we compare notes? How do we, how do we like, like there's open databases now, there's open analytic tools. How do we line these things up so that we can have richer, more interesting data based conversations? And so that when we arrive at conclusions, we can share the conclusions and put them up for review annotation and the people who hate this conclusion can say no 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 we think this is true over here but we can then at least see it yeah because right now it's it's like a torrent of essays and posts and tweets and, and anger and, and and all that kind of stuff and that, that doesn't really work and on the controversial wikipedia pages they've got to lock the page right so during the Bush Kerry electoral cycle, the, the George Bush and the John Kerry Wikipedia pages had to be locked because there were lots of people trying to vandalize. Okay, well, how do we bump that up a little bit? And, and Dave, a regenerative community conversation to me is a very, very nice envelope or container for that process. Mm -hmm. right? Well, it's, it's funny because, and this is like Kevin, you know, Kevin got me to do like an intro to regeneration talk mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. And, and I, it's been really helpful because it made me go back and try to think about the introduction to regeneration and, and how, how hard it was for me to explain. And one of the things that I've come to from that thread is like, oh, wow, what I really want is people to change their worldview. That's all, you know? And so like, and, I, and we've been doing our like- You're weekly, not asking much. Exactly. And, I, and we've been doing this like weekly Buddhist Sangha, you know, and like, I'm not very Buddhist, but but the song is fascinating. And it's like, you, you start to look at how they designed the religion. And it's like, oh, that's what's going on here, you know? And it's like, oh, fuck, now you're like in religion making. And that's like, I don't really want to be there. But but at the end of the day, I mean, everything that we're talking about has, you know, somehow you're changing the way people think or or, or what they think or, you know, right? I mean, we're asking people to, to learn at, at a general, at a gentlest term or change their mind. Right or or more fundamentally change the way they see the world, <clears throat> and I don't know that we ask ourselves how that's done enough. You know, so I guess spiral dynamics is in some sense saying this is the process you go through to change your mind. But you know, there is something about it's not logic clearly. You know, and and now it's not even like good journalism, right? <laughs> because we fucked that up. So it, it's some kind of an immersion, or it's some kind of set of experiences but they happen over time or you know so it's a repeated process and i mean we actually know some of the things that it takes to change our minds you know i'm just not sure that we, we apply them very very consistently and i don't know that we study them very carefully yeah i don't know the history of scientology and i think it would be really cool to you know thinking about because you can kind of see people sitting around saying, well, you know, if we were going to change the direction of the world, you know, if we just got them to believe in the afterlife, you know, then everything would be so much easier. Sorry, I was muted. <clears throat> Here's the nexus of stuff I've got on personal change uh, in particular. So personal change is more than that, but uh, changing behaviors and habit formation is different from changing your mind. So I've got those in different places. But here's a bunch of collection of people who left racist nationalist groups. Uh, here's people who left the church, uh, ex-evangelicals. Uh, I highly recommend following Chrissy Stroop, who posts like wonderfully on Twitter. Um, 
but oh, her book was disappointing. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. That's very yeah. too bad. Because I, 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 I had high hopes for that book. Yeah, but uh, you know, in changing your mind, Jerry. Um, yeah. There's also all the people who are getting into stuff. You're 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 showing examples of people coming out. All right. Do you have examples of people who are going in? Oh, you bet. <laughs> You okay. Bet. Let me just connect this to today's call, and then go back out to. Because um, I just did a post on neuro linguistic programming, you know, recently. Uh -huh. uh, you know, as you know, most of what you're doing, we need to start teaching symbolic logic in junior high school so that people can, you know, resist NLP. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't know that they don't know a logical fallacy when they see one. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so I had, I'm, I'm looking for it now, but basically I found, um, here we go. Got it. Ending child abuse is a recruitment vector for QAnon. So one of my beliefs and this, I got from Alice Miller is that different kinds of child abuse are far more prevalent than we think they are partly because we've socialized, we've normalized a lot of actually really pretty abusive things uh, that we do to kids. Uh, never mind satanic ritual abuse or anything like that. Um, but there's a there's like mothers for QAnon. There's a whole bunch of moms who heard some truths in the QAnon spiels, the QAnon memes, and were like, well, yes, nobody else is saying that. I will follow this group. And that was a tunnel into the rabbit hole of QAnon, which then means you're believing a whole bunch of other stuff. But then you got a whole bunch of people running around with you going, yes, that's true. So so you've got community. And 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 community is this incredible, powerful force. So I have another thought. Um, uh, I think I've got something about incels, basically. Um, uh, I have to find it. But that during Trump's run-up, um, there were, you know, if you posted the uh, Pepe the Frog meme that went viral that day, you were giving high fives on 8chan uh, you know, behind the curtain that day, and you were making friends and community and building really strong relationships. And by the way, the reason soldiers hate, you know, getting out of war is that there is no stronger bond than that between soulmates or, you know, uh, uh, fighting mates in an insurgency. And if you see QAnon and uh, the, the Trump Trumpocalypse as an insurgency, click, 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 click. All those pieces just hum together. They just hum together. And, and so people are getting from involvement in these movements uh, of the kind of juice that they don't get from society. And in the meantime, when they look outside, society is busy melting down, partly because they've been radicalized and they're breaking everything. But hey, what the heck? Here, alt-right trolls feel a sense of community inside their insurgency. That's, uh, And then I'm going to connect that to... Um, membership emotion. So I've got a big thought emotion and membership Trump reason most of the time. Stories are the vessel. This is a really important node for me. Really important because facts don't convince sure, facts don't change people's minds often. Facts don't change people's minds. We need to realize that. Yeah, because well, because facts don't create a frame. Right. What's the line? You can't reason. You cannot reason somebody out of a position they do not reason themselves into. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, it, Irving Goffman's frame analysis is useful to knowing, you know, you know, what can get in and what can, you know, you know, reinforce and other stuff that gets rejected. You know, it's also Santa Fe Institute. You know, complex adaptive mm -hmm. system stuff. Right. That, mm -hmm. you know, the pre-existing schema only allows in certain kinds of information through the semi-permeable membrane of the organization. Other stuff gets deflected, self-reinforcing its own worldview, back to worldview. And so. one of the interesting things about organizations and their worldviews is that they create a filter with which to exclude handily competing worldviews that might actually disarm or, or yeah. you know, or tear down. But their, their, eventually their you become view. dysfunctional to your fitness landscape, right? right? And if that's the case, right, then, you know, you're, you're headed toward an extinction event because you're not relevant. Right. This is what I hope. You is have happening. access to resources. This is what I hope is happening to Vladimir Putin in the next couple of months. Exactly that. 
because he has an entire nation under thrall with lies with a whole armature of media basically spinning what's happening in on on his story all of which is undermined by actual facts and truth and and stuff that's happening on the ground so i think at some point uh, Russia has a long and ignoble history of their military laying down their arms. And, I, and, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm counting on that. I'm counting the, on the Russian military being so de so demoralized and so broken that they say, no, fuck you, we're, we're, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. I forget where I saw it, but somebody described the, the five word summary of Russian history is, quote, and then it got worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Russia has this like crazy way of wasting humans. Like, like in World War II, how many Americans died in World War II? 438,000. How many Germans died in World War II? 21 million. How many Russians died in World War II? Are you counting the famines too? 28 million. Uh, famines before and after. Uh, if the famine was during the war caused by the war, it's probably in that number. But but no, Mao and Stalin caused other deaths, including yeah. including one of the reasons Ukraine has a beef with Russia is the kulaks. You know the the yeah. dekulakization, which is not World War II. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, the whole the, of the, the exactly. is, You know, if 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 you don't give the credit to the logistics people and the quartermaster corps that they deserve, right? you will never be able to effectively do anything. Yeah. They're the, you know, if you have a really good quartermaster core, you can accomplish a lot. If you don't have a, you know, the military's view of a great supply chain, <laughs> bye. And yes, there's Stalin. Is it he was a, a revolutionary? Good looking young man. Yeah, he actually looked like George Michael. Okay, maybe that's why he had such a following. I'm sorry, just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So I, I, Jerry, that's fascinating stuff. Um, but the number of people that are engaging in a conversation like the type that we have here and are having today is such a small fraction of the population is back to Dave, right? That's because Dave's and not how do you, yet. How, how do you, you know, uh, get adjacency spun up so that people want to know about this? We need to right? whitelist, we need to whitelist the country. <clears throat> and I wish it weren't called whitelist, but we need to whitelist the country by which I mean, um, every one of these communities needs to reach out to people that are a little bit more, on the opposite end than they are and build slow relationships and try to be helpful and actually listen, not convince, not sell, not anything like that, but just listen and, and so forth. Some people need to go to the middle of the country and volunteer and show up and just keep showing up and be present. And over time, uh, people will stop leaving those kinds of things, I think. Do you, do you think you could actually get there without punching their amygdala first like everybody else does? So that's the theory of personal change. Like sometimes, <laughs> sometimes only sometimes only crisis will provoke a change, right? Okay. Uh, but but sometimes not. And I think I, I don't know, but I think it it varies I, by human. I, I, so can I can I just push back on that slightly, Jerry? I, I totally sure. I realized that. I was exaggerating as I was saying it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I I mean, as an individual, I agree that you know um, finding ways to have civil conversation and and you know if if you ever go out door knocking for a candidate, you know, all the evidence suggests that the most impactful thing about uh, canvassing is not that you change the minds of the voters um, that you try to talk to unless you're doing deep canvassing, but that the canvassers mind gets changed. Mm. Uh, because by having so many conversations, you realize uh, people approach stuff in so many different ways that your way is just one and you know if you're hoping to move people you know to vote for your candidate you certainly cannot uh take everything as black and white but that said um you know when you think about macroeconomic or macro 
factors like climate and how they affect huge numbers of people at once, right? Like inflation right now is a problem mainly because everybody experiences it every day. Um, and so the shock of seeing things suddenly more expensive than you were remembering, especially like, you know, if you're driving um, uh, and, you know, no need to go fill up your car with gas um, is like a daily experience. Um, and so, you know, the financialization of our economy, which is, I think, at root, you know, the deindustrialization and financialization experience, which hollowed out a big chunk of the Midwest, which is the battleground for politics today in terms of who's going to run the country. Um, you know, sending some nice people to go live in, in those places, you know, may help them rebuild over time. But in the meantime, you know, people are hurting and they're not getting any help. No, but the people so, who go to try to be helpful could be immediately helpful on things that I'm matter to the people on really the ground. That, that volunteerism doesn't scale to the level of the problem. So it, it would be good, yep. but if the federal government said, we're going to go spend you know, billions of dollars to build new uh, uh, you know, land-grant universities and, and uh, community colleges, and you know, we're going to place lots of jobs, lots of decent middle-class paying jobs uh, centered on things like education and health in these places at the scale of billions and billions of dollars. I mean, you look at John Fetterman's story, right? He's a, he's a really interesting candidate because he comes, I mean, he went to the Kennedy School, but you don't know that. What you know is he's this sort of working class guy with tattoos up and down his arms, who with his wife, you know, settled in a, the, the very first steel town in Pennsylvania, which is completely hollowed out and struggled really hard to do all the things that you're saying, right? They, they, they bought properties, converted them, turned them into cafes and, and, and art studios and, and you know, got a little bit of a revival going. And then the biggest employer in town, which is a hospital decided that it was pulling out. And he, try, you know, they, they all fought it and they lost. Um, now he has a powerful story which can resonate with lots of other people who are experiencing this, but mm -hmm. he didn't solve the problems of that town. Uh, yes. So, so um, the, my, my, you know, it's just sort of the, the little steps that individuals might take as volunteers, you know, going into these places don't scale to the level of the problem. Um, several small things. One is um, sometimes if the problem didn't get solved because the problem was really huge and intractable, community got built and political issues got set aside because you started to trust people who you formerly didn't trust. That's that's a win right there. And then the other and the other, the other thing is let let me turn the telescope backwards, which is um, if we tomorrow if tomorrow all the churches were to stop sending missionaries and to stop going on mission and to stop collecting funds and feeding people everywhere and taking care of building hospitals wherever, how would the world be? Worse, it would be worse. I, 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 but, that, but that's a grassrootsy kind of movement that's happened around the world where there's lots of volunteers meeting problems at scale that governments are failing to address. I, you, the, la I, the only place where I would disagree is whether they're meeting them at scale. And by the way, we, yeah. in, our, in the goodness of our hearts, have decided that it's a matter of federal policy to not allow any any money that we might give as a government towards these programs to tell people about birth control or or um, right abortion. No, no, no. I, I think that the missionary thing is completely. I, it, I there's lots to talk about there yeah. for sure. Yeah, um, I'm just saying that that they've been forced to scale because of the scale of our problems, not that they're solving the problems, but they're working at a, at a, at a scale that yeah. I think is astonishing. Yeah. I mean, the right. fact is that, you know, you, you vacuums form and something comes in the, um, you know, the, the fact that chef Andre and world central kitchen has been so phenomenally successful is because 
the Red Cross was going in and feeding people, but they were doing it like, you know, the military with MREs, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this is really bad food. I, I'm mm -hmm. kind of alive, but, you know, I kind of don't want to be, yeah. all right? And he came in and mobilizes the chefs and the people whose restaurants are closed and said, let's feed some people, right? And like Doctors Without Borders, it's a relatively efficient pipeline of of money because what would it cost to hire a doctor? Well, the doctors and doctors without borders for the most part, and a lot of them are volunteers. So you're creating infrastructure for them to be able to do what they do. Um, but at any rate, I, I look at it and I say, we're, we're creating other ways to do some of the tasks that were only done by religious institutions and others, right, through other mechanisms, right? And, and some of the traditional, you know, delivery systems are beginning to show, you know, they're not as resilient. They're a little bit more fragile than we thought. Dave, they're not regenerative. I just wanted to, <laughs> no, no, I think it is an abundant strategy, right? It's like, if you're asking, kind of, if you're asking for input, you're, you're creating a structure wherein many, many people can contribute, you know, that's, that's a good, good point. Yeah. But I, I wanted to just plug the, the book that, I, I, if anybody's read it, I would love to get their reactions to it too, just to see if I'm reading too much into it. But the, uh, the Carter book on Keynes, I just finished. And I do feel like he presents Keynes as deliberately conducting a worldview shift where he kind of like takes economics and I guess he's brilliant, right? So it must be like orders of magnitude smarter than the average dude, but, but, and he's able to redefine a bunch of the widely accepted economics behavior in the you know, early 1900s and say, nah, that's not really how it works. It really works like this and this and this, right? And then kind of deliberately through a life course of his life, um, get it adopted by at large scale by the United States government, right? Is, and, that, the right, is that the right book, Dave? Uh, I, I stuck in the, Zach, the title. Zach Carter? In uh, yeah. The, uh, well, I didn't see right, the exactly, point. exactly. Oh, yeah. you did. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it. That's the price of peace. Yep. And, and so then, you know, and it gets attacked and, you know, it ends up being, you know, kind of almost taken down by McCarthyism, right? 50 years later. So it's kind of fascinating how he, and this is like his history. So I don't know if it's an accurate history exactly, but it's the only one I know. And, but he does talk about how, like, one of the things he did was he kind of redefined things that we thought we knew, right? And so he kind of challenges, you know, the, the gold standard and, and the role of inflation and what the government's role was in the economy and, you know, the markets versus the government and, you know, kind of fundamental things. <clears throat> and I'm kind of wondering what kinds of things we're accepting is true that we need to discard in order to reach this next, you know, worldview, you know, and one of the things I'm going after is, is carbon and net neutrality and carbon and you know stuff and climate that that's we're somehow distracted by this is my my view but i don't think that's a big enough idea to actually you know change change the, the world's world view or anything but but I, i'm kind of curious about like what assumptions have we made you know gas prices and inflation in, in the amount of economy is that is that really the thing that's going on or is there something else that's happening that we should be looking for i love that question dave uh let me just refine it for a second, because I'm a big fan of George Monbiot's uh, TEDx talk, The New Political Story That Could Change Everything. I'll share it in the chat. I think I've mentioned on these calls before, I might not have. What he says is, after, the, after World War II, we kind of lived inside of Keynes's story. And I just connected that to the, Prince of, uh, the, the Price of Peace, which is the biography you just mentioned. So it's connected mm -hmm. there now. Uh, but but Keynes's story is disorder afflicts the land caused by the powerful and nefarious forces of the economic elite, which have captured the world's wealth. The hero of the story, the enabling state supported by working class and middle class people will contest that disorder, will fight those powerful forces by redistributing wealth and through spending public money on public goods will generate income and jobs, restoring harmony to the land. By the way, each of these stories starts with disorder afflicts the land and ends with restoring harmony to the land, which is a joke in his, in his talk. He does a very good job. He says, then there was a very successful selling off of that story that happens with the neoliberal agenda. And I've got a whole bunch of stuff on neoliberalism. But that story in his writing is disorder afflicts the land caused by the powerful and nefarious forces of the overmighty state whose collectivizing tendencies crush freedom and individualism and opportunity. The hero of the story, the entrepreneur, will fight these powerful forces, roll back the state, and through creating wealth and opportunity, restore harmony to the land. I like this a lot. And then he says, what we're missing is the next story. 
Like we're trying to leap to a new story, but nobody's got a good one. Let me make an offer. His offer he calls the restoration story. Maybe he could have called it the regeneration story. It would be just as good. He says, disorder afflicts the land caused by the powerful and nefarious forces of people who say there's no such thing as society, who tell us that our highest purpose in life is to fight like stray dogs over a dustbin. The heroes of the story, us, we'll revolt against this disorder. We'll fight those nefarious forces by building rich, engaging, inclusive, and generous communities. And in doing so, we will restore harmony to the land. Yeah, that's really helpful to me, Jerry. I mean, I because that's kind of where I've ended up is like, the, if I had a big idea, I think it is. And it's, it comes back to the stuff that you've been doing forever, Mika, is that it's I, that it's the civic layer that sits between government and the market exactly. yeah, that, that we are developing. And I apparently and it, mentioned it back in 2021 in this call. Huh? And it's, it's represented by the internet, right? It's, it's, it's the, that's the infrastructure that allows that civic layer to organize. Not and, anymore the internet, but yes, to the, everything before that. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I still think the internet is is the infrastructure. The fact that parts of the internet have been corrupted, or or there's you know there's problems with the internet, I don't think makes it. But but to me, and, and it's, it then is also reflected in whatever collective goods we're creating, right? So the Linuxes of the world, or the 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 um the Wikipedia's of the world, those collective goods are still infrastructure assets for civic society outside of government control, outside of market control, right? That it's that layer of development that I think that's the, you know, that's what happens in this next generation if we're if we're if we're gonna win. Kind of. yeah, Jerry, you just described why the Mad Max movies work so well is because you know the Brownian motion of disorder, right, is is a narrative. Everything's collapsed, right? And so, you know, but the, they don't point to what's going to be next, right? The, the, it's kind of survive, right? The alternative narrative, which the, the key word there is community, is, you know, the hero of the story is not centralization, but networks, right? Um, you know, p potentially being, you know, the way that you create structure, but it's not, you know, centralized. It's not hub and spoke. It's not, 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 right? Um, it's, it's nodal as opposed to command and control. Uh, we just don't necessarily have all of the, we don't even have an accounting system that, that, that could handle that well right now because it was designed for an agrarian society adapted for an industrial society and it doesn't know how to deal with an intangible, you know, a blended intangible, right? Um, uh, so yeah, it, here's... Uh, I've got a friend in Woods Hole, Mass, who I met years ago, uh, who picked up the thinking of another guy who's died since on rethinking double entry bookkeeping, which goes back to Pol Polazzo or something like that. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, well, so double entry is, is, is interesting as far as trying to decrease fraud. About, let it me, doesn't let me, necessarily let, get let, you the let, system. Go ahead. Yeah, keep yeah. Going. No, let me actually finish the story because he's not trying to make double entry bookkeeping better. He's trying to create a system where all the exchanges of energy are basically uh, found and registered at each transaction so that instead of having multiple sets of books, like where's our inventory right now, how much money mm -hmm. do we make and how much pollution did we cause, his integrated system would actually kick out those kinds of uh, that that kind of information as it goes. Now he's not a coder, and I don't think he's written the system. But the ambition was to create a more useful accounting for what's actually happening. Yeah, I got it. I I, I only point out that um, you know going back to Art Brock for a second is even that accounting does much better of accounting for things that have gotten down to the point where. Um, they're dead. They're dead components that you can actually put into a spreadsheet, even if it's a complex multi-dimensional one. Um, it doesn't do a good job of describing a living system. We still don't have one that does a good job of, of that. Mm -hmm. So now that we've solved everything, I don't know. I got vertigo just watching you move around. Oh, sorry. I, I can dim my screen. I, I, I will do that because I've got to move around a little bit right now. Um, and I've got to move to uh, an appointment, medical appointment for Heidi. So it was great seeing you folks. And Peter, say something. I want to hear your voice for a second before I go. 
Just one, two, two, two. <laughs> check, check. check, good, to, check. good to hear your voice, my friends. Cheers. Bye-bye now. Cheers. Thanks, bye. Guys. Bye, bye. <laughs>
um, and so when we started the, the, the program, the, the first question was always, what problem are we trying to solve? And we managed to take them out of that mindset and basically by reframing upwards, to reframe the problem of uh, a poor person in Tanzania who is trying to get access to financial services, to frame that upwards to something like a um, women entrepreneurs network that's working in multiple territories. And um, so those two projects, so I basically took all that learning including what I did for InnoTribe and Swift at Tele, and I'm building a, a project that is, the working title is uh, The Scaffold, which is an, um, a scaffold for something. It's a, the, 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 it's a scaffold for a school and possibly a foundation for the never normal, uh, where we are going, which is intended to be 100% um, uh, online, which is powered by a digital uh, residency platform where we invite specifically for client clients uh, a, a group of navigators uh, that can enter those com converse conversations. So it's all about conversations, not about pitching. Yeah. Um, and it's with a lot of exercises, even online, with people who are very advanced in things like Miro boards without just having post-it uh, stick uh, sort of mechanics. And also a, a digital asset sharing platform, which probably goes into the direction of what Jerry is dreaming of this memory of what happened during those six months. Um, so the plan is to get a first client signed by October of this year and start executing on that project hopefully by the end of the year. So one client. And I'm looking for people who want to join this effort, whether as an advisor or as a navigator or in other ways. And it's part of, a, a, have evolved a lot in a, it's part of Peter Van Studios, which in the end is, a, it's three studios. Studio one is the art studio, studio two is the intervention studio, and studio three is the scaffold. And I've been assisted by a, a guy uh, who comes from the contemporary art scene, who is, a, who is helping artists professionalize their practice. And so he helped me identifying a number of uh, methods, dynamics, and outcomes that surprise, surprise, apply to the three studios. Yeah. So, and these are things like uh, collision and layering and that sort of things, which I do in my artwork, but I'd also do it when I'm composing these expeditions and I'm using on purpose the word com composing. So I'm not a conductor of the orchestra. I'm, I'm, writing, the, I'm writing the script yeah, of, uh, of the, the piece. Uh, methods or dynamics like, um, and maybe the words are not well chosen, but dynamics like um, uh, reframing um, uh, and outcomes like provocations, transformations, and collaborations. And those are the outcomes. So I'm, I'm working on a new website, which will be probably not the sort of website that you expect, so it will be a bit of artistic. Um, hopefully making people curious and it will include those three studios. And there were also a couple of things that I wanted to share maybe for next call that are I think relevant to everything that was discussed today and, and in my piece. There is Venkate Rao. It's probably quite known to most of you who has uh, um, a fabulous series of essays that he did on a topic of lore craft. It's absolutely fantastic. Lore craft and lore craft, L O R E craft. Uh, and some, I don't know exactly the words he used, but he said marketing is 
a way for organizations to uh, convince or let other people buy in into what they offer. Yeah. But Lorecraft is how people make sense inside organization of, of their own psyches <laughs> in the organization. So, right? It's it's absolutely fascinating. He has a second set, series of essays uh, under the title of The Graph Mind, which is playing on the topic of like the Borg, but the Borg in a very positive way. So not for creating dystopian scenarios, but for utopian. That's pretty scenario. much what I'm describing for the shared memory project that I'm on. Exactly that. And, yeah. he, and yeah, his so, draft mind post is on my list of people and things to talk to about that. Yeah. And then there is a, a fantastic book uh, by James Bridle, uh, Ways of Being. Uh, that may answer some of the questions of David. Um, so on your question, what are, what, what, um, what are we missing? Yeah, or what perspectives are we missing? Or, so he's basically, his book is all about, and I'm probably making a lot of shortcuts, it's about non-human intelligence. So he's starting with AI as artificial intelligence like to trying to um, mimic or do better than humans, but maybe humans is not the right reference <laughs> point. Maybe we should look at other intelligences like a lot of them in nature, um, uh, also the difference in time. So if you start having a perspective where you look at how plants grow over a season, then you have another perspective than the short term. So it's, it's a fascinating book. It's a very, very well researched, I highly recommend it. And the last pointer I would like to make is to a young lady, um, called Phoebe Tickel, P-H-O-E-B-E. -E. Phoebe, is that how they pronounce it? And Tickle, T-I-C-K-E. Phoebe, yeah. Tickle, T-I-C-K-E-L. Oh, she's in your memory, right? Yep. Uh, and she's working on a thing called uh, Moral Imaginations. Don't have that. And there is a wonderful video also going with, with people on a train. Um, and she's looking for people to join her on the right. Sweet, super interesting. Yeah, she's, she's really, really, I mean, she's like, a, uh, she has a, she's a, from, I think she's from London. She has a very British um, accent, English accent, but there's something poetic in what she's doing that I am very attracted to, to that dimension. But moral imagination, and it's all also about how you create communities and how you let flow value in those communities and these flow generations. It's very, very interesting. That's it. Um, Peter, it's too bad you've been doing nothing. It's like an office whole time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I have a feeling that some of the things that we've been talking about on this call, thirty years down the road, will be the new religions or the new platforms or the new meme that caught fire and everybody was suddenly like oriented around and 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 it's like okay, good, we'll we'll just do this, right? Uh, and, and I don't mean everybody, because that's impossible. You always have a, a minority. But if you have 15% of a population, apparently you can tip things. If you have a, a, just a gentle, minor, a gentle majority, you can actually sort of run democracy. Uh, apparently, you can run democracy with a substantial minority as well, if you buy the right instruments of uh, in the process. But, but yeah. So, so Dave, all you need to do is like, like meld the regenerative platform into the Peter studio scaffold. I'm happy to contribute the big fungus and other ideas that I've got along the way. Good, fantastic. Well, and I love the, uh, the, the different ways of thinking thing is like just kind of like slowly working my way into my mind. And, and, you know, so the, the, 
first one that the regeneration folks go to is biomimicry, I think. Like, you know, what do we learn from living systems? And, and like, just the other day, somebody, we were kind of asking like, well, what can we learn about governance by, from biomimicry? And there must be all kinds of like decision-making processes for, you know, who gets allocate, allocation of resources and I don't know, but, you know, and, and I don't know. I don't, I don't even know who's asking that question about, you know, but it seems like an interesting question. There, and there must be all kinds of insights. So much to look into. Then there is something interesting, but probably at a more local uh, scale. And I'm not sure it will happen. Um, so there is in the city of Ghent. Um, there is a, something called the Winter Circus which is actually a, a stone built arena form circus that was used as a circus. Yeah? So with elephants and, and so on. And then some guy bought the whole thing and he basically used this as his uh, exhibition room for his collection of old timers. And then uh, it was emptied. And now basically the city of Ghent has, has refurbished uh, the whole thing uh, in what, they, what is called in architecture casco. So they still have to do the interiors, but the windows are in and everything is, is clean. And so there is a consortium that is now uh, going to get a license to exp do the exploitation of this winter circus with a a license, an exploitation license of 75 years. I mean, talking about long term. Um, and so it's a very interesting consortium, including uh, universities and um, art schools and uh, engineers and entrepreneurs that is putting up the money to make this. It's a public private uh, setting. And I'm and so the ideas that they make of this thing, I mean, they have some some ideas of, about like, uh, it's like an MIT media, something that they want to build. But I think, um, so it's both, both a, a place where they can have offices, yeah. they can rent, but the whole idea is not to make an office space or um, like full of retail and restaurants. It really has to become a, a, the hotspot for the citizens of Ghent to come in contact with new, new ways of thinking, new developments, new technologies, new. So and it has a huge arena, um, circular arena, that apparently they're going to get uh, companies like Barco, who is a, a Flemish company, to put a very interesting projection systems so you can create immersive experiences in this place, in this open arena, and have breakouts. There are fantastic rooms in there where you could do uh, open, open, what is it the sort of thing that you did, Jerry? Open, open, it's open groups. Yep. Oh, open yeah. space. Open spaces or highly facilitated things like the scaffold uh, could be part of that. So I think it's very interesting that the city of Ghent they want to create, because the, 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 the circus will have four entries, basically north, south, west, and east. So people will be able to walk through this thing. Uh, it will be open all day, except the offices that are in there and the companies. But Very all sort of stuff is going to happen and they're looking for curators and that sort of things to make the place exciting. For the, not only for the city and for the, it's, um, uh, its image internationally, but also for the citizen of Ghent, which is a rare type of animal, by the way. And Peter, you know the Nextworks folks, right? Yes. yes. Do you know? Do you know if they're involved in this at all? Because they're in Ghent. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Peter Hinson is. Okay. Cool. 
Fabulous. Yeah, but it, it, it's not Nextworks, but it's true Peter Vincent that I got knowledge of this project. Oh, he, uh, and he just did a really nice so, interview of me on his podcast. So, yes. So he he um, he's one of the uh, members of the consortium. This is not public, right? So the, ah, the okay. So don't worry. The, it's the only in my brain. Yeah. It's basically, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the 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 consortium is basically led by uh, the local chamber of commerce. And they have grouped around them a whole set of really, really interesting people, entrepreneurs, etc. And Peter is one of them. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's clear that they will get the the, the contract because it's a, it's an official procedure. Um, and so and made there were initially two two consortia, but uh, one consortia basically dropped the ball. So there's only one candidate to run it. So they have to go through the official procedure and, and may they indicated that that consortium is the preferred partner to continue working with. And so, nor, so that will take some time, but I think that will happen. Yeah? And they have already funds committed by all the stakeholders to make it happen. Um, but who is part of the consortium is not public. Which seems a little strange, but there you are. Well, there, all, there will be a press promising. moment this week. There will be a press moment this week, okay? Because there were some uh, some some articles in local press that were not representing the whole thing correctly, and so they're going to have a, a formal press moment where they will probably announce who is part of that that whole thing, so that so that everybody knows there is no secret. But cool, they want to do it the proper way. From a communication point of view, it it makes me think also maybe more broadly, um, what's a really good arrangement for cities to revitalize themselves? Mm -hmm. um, in in Portland, there's a family called McMenamins. There are a couple of brothers and a sister, and uh, years ago they started buying sort of dilapidated properties, including churches and other sorts of things, and then refurbishing them and turning them into saloons, bars, restaurants, hotels theaters, other kinds of stuff. And they're brilliant. I think they have 83 properties in the Pacific Northwest. You can get a McMenamin's passport and you get it stamped when you go to places. And then each place has two little hidden things you have to find. It's kind of cute. Um, there's an elementary school that they took over that's just south of the airport here in PDX called the Kennedy School, not named after John F. Kennedy, um, where at the end of our first visit to that school, April and I looked at each other, each other and said, wow, this is a different city. We could maybe live here. Um, and the Kennedy School has uh, two restaurants, a spa, a bowling alley, a movie theater, uh, two bars, uh, a hotel, and I'm forgetting something else, all tucked away you know, in, in one space. They also have a place, an entertainment venue just outside of town, 20 minutes east of the airport called Edgefield, which used to be the poor farm for Portland, which means when you found indigent people or whatever, you sent them out to the poor farm where you could work and eat and get shelter, a thing that's missing in society right now in different ways, uh, in really crucial ways. But it fell into disuse and then uh, McMenamins bought it up and refurbed it. There they have a vineyard, a hotel, multiple restaurants, and a, and a, and a huge performance outdoor performance venue with a big stage and a big sloping lawn that's just gorgeous. Um, so we also ringing a bell for David uh, on how to regenerate cities. Right. I mean, we can use the word everywhere, so it works great that way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I stuck a link in the chat too, and it made, made me think, Peter. I don't know, or any of us. Have you, the uh, a dear friend of mine taken over as uh, ED at the uh, Berkman Center at Harvard, and uh, they're kind of have an open uh, agenda. And so, if we had cool ideas, you know, we could we could contribute them and i think what they really miss is like old white guys with, you know with really what they want but yeah exactly um, but uh <laughs> but anyway she i think would be receptive is this to sue hendrickson yeah yeah, yeah. She, she's like yeah. an old you know grad school classmate and dear friend and you know she's pretty open to, to listening to stuff if we had things to pitch kind of i think and i don't know i don't know what to we pitch but it's, a, it's an interesting channel and it's always been yeah. one of my favorite places but it's kind of gone into disarray i think so um, cool 
I just turned around and half the group is lost left. Sorry. It's that the time is the time is ticked. But... It is. Our, we are all turning into pumpkins. Um, Peter, thank you for sharing all that. I have I now have a whole bunch of tabs open to read and uh, things to learn about. Um, yeah, it's wonderful stuff, Michael. Cool. Yeah, it's always yeah. brilliant to learn about somebody repurposing a space in creative ways to try to rebuild community and tackle yeah, issues. There is, there is something, so, there is, there is something, so no, another person I want to highlight um, that is also has accepted to become an advisor for this scaffolding. It's uh, Andrea Ion Koja, Kojokura. <laughs> it's a young, brilliant uh, woman, uh, originally Romanian, but has studied in the US and is now working in Germany. She's a lot working on VR with a really, really solid philosophical background. Uh, yeah, so I, I think in my latest delicacies, I, I, I referred to her to a recent talk that she did. Andrea Kujukuri. So, uh, so her company is Numena, N-U-M-E-N-A, Numena.de from Germany, D-E. And so the idea is that uh, we use VR in this scaffold thing uh -huh. to um, not to make replicas of reality, but to create other spaces where other behaviors are possible that are not possible in reality. So like, for example, also your motor cortex to see what happens if you start playing around with that. So, so if you are used to act as an, octop as an octopus with eight arms, and when you, once you get that knowledge internalized, and if you then go back with that knowledge into the real world, what, ha what can you do with that? Yeah. You probably get. Well, really, if you would apply really, this to the really winter frustrated. circus, yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> could be or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's very solar, solar punk as well, but she has a really solid philosophical foundation. She's oh. wonderful. She she could entertain you a, a session of yours. I haven't asked her if she would be interested, but she's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and, and watch her talk that I put in my latest delicacies of uh, over the weekends. Um, or I can find it back as well. But, uh, I'm not multitasking sort of person, so I, I can't do chat and, and, and. And, and then the other person is also part of the scaffold advisory team. It's a Stephanie uh, Sherman. S H E R M A N, mm -hmm. Sherman. Uh, and amongst many other things, she is the course director of the Master of Narrative Environments at the um, St. Martin's School, Art School in London, which is part mm -hmm. of the University of Arts in London. Um, and she's doing a PhD with. Um, Benjamin Breton in San Diego. Wow. Benjamin Breton, who was part of the other engagement that I talked about earlier. Yeah. So he, that's, yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So maybe next call we massage these things and see how they fit or understand them a little better or, or something like that. Because uh, Peter, you have a great nose for for interesting new ventures and people like this, and I, we, we've missed you. Um, and so let's see if we can help remix and uh, add some spices to this stew. Okay, is good. Um, anything else for now, Dave? You want to yeah jump in? And one last totally random thing, Jerry. Like we're going through, we're moving, right? We're leaving, we're leaving Oakland. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Where are you going? Yeah. We don't know. We're gonna we're gonna hop in a car and drive for a few months. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Okay. We're, we're gonna be no fixed address. Um, Are you doing but, the van life for a while? Exactly. Exactly. Except except it'll be in a sedan. Sedan life. Nice. Much more. Many more Airbnbs in sedan life than in their yeah. own van life. I think. Uh, but um, I'm so I'm going through old papers and stuff like that. And one of the things I found was the attendee list for the 2002 online community summit. Oh. Um, which is like I don't know 40 or 50 people. 
and I was trying to figure out if there ought to be like, if, if, you know, it's, it's, it's you and Kevin Jones and a I don't reunion know, would be great. Well, that's kind of, I, I was kind of a little tempted to like, I don't know, stick that list somewhere like on a LinkedIn chat or something like that. I, I don't know if there's any, if you have any thoughts or if it's, if it's fun or not fun, I don't know. You could easily create an OCS uh, LinkedIn group, invite everybody to it and see who shows up and if anybody wants to talk. Yeah, okay. That's kind of really, what I was really thinking. Something get lightweight, you know, just a casual invitation. Sounds great. Sounds like fun. Uh, um, you might want to just photocopy the sheet and post it, you know, uh, post it on your LinkedIn feed or something like that, or I don't, I don't know, just, you know, share it back up. Okay. All right. I might do, I might do that then. So, yeah. And is Cashel still around? I mean, he, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I actually go have lunch with him, so I'll ask him about what he thinks too. But uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Sweet. Well, is, well, great, wonderful, wonderful call, man. Gentlemen, really, really rich stuff. My brain is full, and so is my browser. <laughs> Take um, care. See you thank guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Next time.